Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to this episode of the Dr. GPCR podcast. Before we jump into this episode, I'd like to share a few things with you. The December and last Dr. GPCR newsletter of 2020 is now available. If you haven't subscribed yet, please visit drgpcr.com slash newsletter. Also, don't forget to share the newsletter with your colleagues. We cannot wait to bring you brand new Dr. GPCR newsletter editions in 2021. Second, we will be taking a short break of the Dr. GPCR podcast in January 2021 as our family will be welcoming a baby boy. But rest assured, we are already working on bringing you brand new episodes starting sometimes in February 2021 with an amazing line of, lineup of guests. Also, stay tuned for a major announcement regarding the podcast. We're also proud to announce that we are pursuing consulting opportunities in the GPCR field. For help with your R&D project, please visit drgpcr.com slash consulting or reach out by email at hello at drgpcr.com. And last but not least, we will be closing this first season of the Dr. GPCR podcast with a series of interviews with phenomenal female scientists in the field. We hope you'll enjoy it. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Yamina Bershish, founder of Dr. GPCR, uh, and I'm your host of the Dr. GPCR podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of talking to Dr. Carrie Johnson. She's an assistant professor at the Uniference Services in University of Health Sciences. Hi, Carrie. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so happy we were able to, uh, to get in touch. Um, it's so interesting. So before I, we, we hop into the questions, until I found your profile online, I never heard of the Uni Uniform Services University of Health Sciences. And it turns out that it's in Bethesda. And I worked at NIH uh, previously. So we were in the same city for, for, for a, couple of, a couple of years there. Oh, yeah, we're right across the street, but it, we are a smaller institution for sure. Um, so we do tend to be a little overshadowed by our neighbor over there. <laughs> but it's it's great for our uh, collaborative relationships, too. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit uh, about about your career and how you went through, you know, your your studies and your interest in GPCRs? And how did you land where you are today? Sure. So I'm a neuropharmacologist and I've had a long-standing interest in how GPCRs influence synaptic transmission. Uh, as you said, I recently started my lab at Uniform Services University. Uh, my lab is really interested in brain circuits that are involved in reinforcement learning and how they're affected by chronic alcohol exposure. We know that long-term alcohol exposure causes adaptations in brain function at a variety of levels from gene expression to neural circuit function to behavior. And I'm particularly interested in how alcohol-induced changes in neurotransmission produce changes in behavior that contribute to problematic alcohol use. We study this using a variety of techniques with a focus on brain slice electrophysiology recordings and behavioral experiments. So I've been studying GPCRs for my whole career, which is about 16 years now. Um, and I, I started out in a kind of more molecular pharmacology drug discovery setting. So um, I, I did my undergraduate degree in biology at Penn. And after that, I moved to Nashville. And I was really lucky to find a research assistant position there working with Jeff Kahn and Colleen Neiswender at Vanderbilt in the group that eventually became the Vanderbilt Center for Neuroscience Drug Discovery and is now the Warren Center for Neuroscience Drug Discovery. So at that time, they were in really early days of setting up one of the first academic drug discovery programs in the U.S., and it was a really exciting time to be there. In those early years, I did a lot of molecular pharmacology work. I helped establish functional assays for GPCR activity that were used uh, for high throughput screens for the targets that we were interested in, which uh, were primarily metabotropic glutamate receptors and muscarinic receptors. And then did a lot of uh, follow up on, on validating the hits from those screens and, and figuring out selectivity of the new drugs that we were looking at. Uh, the GPCRs that we were interested in then were targets for a wide variety of neurological and psychiatric disorders. And the expertise in that group spanned from medicinal chemistry to behavior. So being there was kind of like a broad education in neuropharmacology itself. And it was just really inspiring on many levels to, to get involved in that kind of research. 
So I, I really was interested in how the group was discovering allosteric modulators that were potential clinical candidates, but a really huge benefit of being there was that we were also developing tools that we could be used preclinically that were more selective for the GPCRs that we were targeting than any of the previously available drugs. And that made it possible to take our basic and preclinical science pursuits in directions that had never been possible before. So I wound up staying in Jeff, Con lab, Jeff Con's lab as a graduate student uh, because I really wanted to be able to take advantage of that kind of unique situation of having these novel tools available. But I shifted away from the drug discovery work at that point um, because I became more drawn to thinking about GPCRs in the context of brain circuits. Uh, at the time, brain circuits involved in movement disorders, but also in uh, things like learning and memory. So I've spent a lot of my time since then using whole cell patch clamp electrophysiology and brain slices to study how GPCRs fine tune the activity of neural pathways in the basal ganglia, which are a group of brain regions that are important for voluntary movement and many aspects of learning. After I finished my PhD at Vanderbilt, I moved to Bethesda to do my postdoc training at the NIH in Dave Lovinger's lab at the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. So when I was there, I continued to focus on GPCR effects on synaptic transmission in the basal ganglia, but I kind of shifted to thinking about them more in the context of reinforcement learning and how they're involved in addictive disorders, especially alcohol use disorder. And more recently, um, in that lab and now in my lab, uh, we've been extending our efforts beyond electrophysiology recordings to think about how the GPCR modulation of synaptic tr transmission that we see in brain slices relates to behavior, particularly reinforcement learning and cognitive flexibility. So that's a major focus of my lab now. We think about GPCRs and how they function under normal conditions, um, how experiences like alcohol exposure change receptor function, and how manipulating GPCRs in specific brain circuits might re reverse behavioral changes that are caused by long-term alcohol exposure. So we're kind of you know, interested in it across these different levels from normal function to, to pathology to potential treatments. Which is fascinating because you you were we're at a point where it's important to understand receptor function in a normal setting, but being able to measure receptor function and see how a disease setting or or you know uh, an alcohol abuse setting would change that circuitry and that function of the receptor is also very valuable for further understanding the role of the receptors in those conditions, but also for drug discovery. Exactly. Yeah. So one of our recent papers was actually showing that in adolescent mice that have been exposed to alcohol, there's a kind of disruption of mglu 2 function in a brain region called the striatum. And there had been some suggestions before that if alcohol causes these disruptions, then maybe we couldn't target it for a therapeutic strategy because, okay, what if it's not there anymore? Or what if it's just not going to respond to activation? But we were actually able to rescue its function by using a positive allosteric modulator. And so I think that was a you know really important proof of concept that okay even if we see that these experiences cause an impairment in the receptor function there might be pharmacological pharmacological strategies that we can use to rescue that but exactly it's important to to understand how that goes awry in the first place and understand that what we see in a naive brain is not necessarily what we're going to see after some sort of experience like alcohol exposure but many other things as well Incredible. So you had this whole set of experiences where you went from the, um, I'd say the traditional molecular pharmacologist, where you were screening and you were uh, trying to understand how receptors, specific receptors that the group was interested in function. And then you kind of shifted more on a physiological uh, role of, of, sub, of sub variety of receptors. Do you have maybe a favorite GPCR or a favorite family of receptors that you focus on in your group? doesn't everybody okay. um, <laughs> no, no that is actually it's not the case uh, you say but it's not necessarily the case uh, that everybody has a favorite but there is obviously uh, you know we all have that little one receptor that made us realize something new Yes, and I'm no exception to that. So I, I've worked with several families of GPCRs over the years, um, including uh, some work with muscarinic receptors early on and some more recent work with cannabis 
cannabinoid receptors. Uh, but the majority of my work has been on metabotropic glutamate receptors, and particularly the MGLU2 subtype, which couples to GIO family G proteins. Um, it's there's a lot of reasons I like this receptor, but glutamate is the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. And we know that changes in the strength and pattern of synaptic transmission at glutamatergic synapses in various brain regions contribute to many CNS disorders. And one of the main functions of mglu 2 is to reduce glutamate release from presynaptic terminals. And that occurs in a lot of different brain regions. So because mglu 2 can regulate glutamate release in different circuits that are all implicated in one CNS disorder or another, there's been a lot of interest in this receptor as a drug target. And another reason that I personally find this receptor really interesting is that, at least in ex vivo preparations, activating it can cause a form of synaptic plasticity called long-term depression. So you activate the receptor briefly with a drug, but it has long-lasting effects on the strength of synaptic transmission. Um, we see this in brain slices, but, but we really don't know what that means for in vivo function at this point. And that, that's kind of a, a very basic science question that I've always been really interested in. That is incredible. Um, so what's the status? So what can you tell us that the audience might not know about the mglu 2 receptor? What's the status of, of research on, on this receptor? Right. So we know that mglu 2 regulates synaptic transmission in brain regions that are often affected in mental health disorders and substance use disorders. So areas involved in executive function, learning, reward, uh, motivation, and, and also stress responses. So we also know that there can be environmental factors that influence mglu 2 function, as I was saying uh, before with the, the work that uh, we did on alcohol exposure and how it disrupts mglu 2 function. Um, based on the collective knowledge about these effects of mglu 2 on synaptic transmission, there's been a lot of classic behavioral pharmacology work done to evaluate mglu 2 as a target in models that might be predictive of things like antidepressant activity and antipsychotic activity. Um, and thinking about uh, substance use disorders, there's also quite a bit of preclinical evidence that activating mglu 2 reduces drug seeking. And, and that doesn't just apply to alcohol, it extends to a variety of drugs, uh, methamphetamine and cocaine and um, heroin. So, um, so there's really a kind of very broad evidence that mglu 2 might be a target in treating substance use disorders. Um, for mglu 2 there's also some interesting research that's been done showing the behavioral effects of global knockout of the receptor. So one finding that's particularly relevant to my interest in alcohol use is that global knockout of mglu 2 has been shown to increase alcohol consumption and preference. Based on these types of experiments using techniques like global receptor deletion or systemic drug delivery, we have a pretty good idea that mglu 2 can modify drug-associated behaviors in rodents. But what these types of experiments aren't very good at doing is telling you what specific brain circuits are changing their activity in response to activation or deletion of a receptor and how those circuit level changes contribute to the behavioral responses you see. Wow. So um, when it comes to the mglu 2 function, the way I understand it, and please excuse my, my, naive, uh, my naive way of understanding it, so whenever you, you take a drug or a, a drug is taken, you create this, uh, this euphoric state and the cell, the body releases all these hormones that make you feel good and activating mglu 2 would kind of block this effect by these drugs and take, get back to the normal level or how does it, how does it work if we know anything about it? Right, yeah. So there's um, this happens on a lot of different levels potentially. So so what you're talking about is you know a very acute effect of drug exposure, right? It causes an increase in dopamine release that produces this euphoric effect. It, it also produces a reinforcing effect that that makes you want to take the drug again. And so there is definitely evidence that mglu 2 activation can reduce that drug induced increase in dopamine. So on a you know very short time scale, yes, mglu 2 can kind of uh, reduce that 
euphoric reinforcing effect potentially. There's also, after repeated drug exposure, long-term changes that happen in connections between different brain regions that can uh, change things like control over behavior, decision-making, uh, you know, things like we think about habitual drug seeking or compulsive drug seeking, uh, where it's not necessarily about chasing that euphoria anymore, um, but becomes a, a kind of more inflexible action to pursue the drug. Um, so that involves some changes in different systems in glutamate transmission, uh, um, which, as I was saying before, mglu2 can regulate. So, uh, you know, when we're thinking more about the, the long-term time scale, uh, mglu2 is also positioned to modify changes in synaptic transmission that would uh, reduce those or, or change those uh, those alterations in glutamatergic transmission that might be promoting problematic drug seeking. Wow, that's uh, that's that's so. I think it's so fascinating to have that kind of yin and yang, and having that the brain go, undergo that change whenever you know there is alcohol abuse or drug abuse, and then how the mglu two can facilitate or at least decrease those behaviors and help re reestablish quote unquote the normal patterns uh, in in the brain. So you'd mentioned that um, one, what we don't know yet is how the, the circuitry is rewired in the brain in the long-term use of alcohol, for example. What are the other challenges that should be addressed to facilitate understanding the function of, of um, MGLU2? Right. So, I mean, I really do think that, that thinking about the circuitry is a, a very big question to focus on, and I'd certainly like to talk about that a little bit more. Um, it's one thing I've been really excited about in my research, as well as research from other groups, is that we've been able to use modern neuroscience techniques like optogenetics to study specific synapses and determine how those synapses are modulated when GPCRs like mglu 2 are activated. So for a long time, thinking about brain slice electrophysiology studies, people used electrical stimulation to evoke synaptic transmission in brain slices and study how GPCRs would regulate transmission that way. But most brain regions that are interested in receive synaptic inputs from at least a few different other brain regions. So when you find that activating a GPCR, say, reduces the strength of electrically evoked synaptic transmission, you don't know if that's happening in a specific set of inputs to the region you're recording or if the receptor has similar effects on all of those inputs. And each of those synaptic inputs might have different influences on behavior. So to really deepen our understanding of what these receptors do, we can incorporate more kind of reductionist techniques that allow us to, to isolate the receptor's activity in specific neurons and circuits. So one of the approaches that I've taken in the past is to express light-activated ion channels like channel reduction in either anatomically or genetically defined populations of neurons that project to the region we're interested in recording. And then we can use flashes of light instead of electrical stimulation to evoke neurotransmitter release from the specific set of inputs. So here I'll just give a shout out to my postdoc mentor, Dave Lovinger, because he coined a term modulomics to give a name to these types of, of experiments, the, the study of circuit-specific neuromodulation by GPCRs. Uh, there's also an increasing number of transgenic mouse models that we can use to dig deeper into circuit-specific GPCR functions. So that's kind of a, another side to the coin here. Um, so my lab is fortunate to have uh, access to genetically engineered mice that were created by Greg Homanix at the University of Pittsburgh that allow us to delete mglu 2 from specific populations of neurons. So just as an example of how these types of models are beneficial, my lab is using these mice to explore how impaired mglu 2 function in specific corticostriatal circuits affects decision making. So um, as I might have mentioned before, alcohol has been shown to increase habit for and one of the major projects we're working on now that's funded by the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism is to explore how mglu 2 activation in corticostriatal circuits interacts with alcohol to bias towards creation of habits. So another major use for these mice is in pharmacological studies too. If we systemically administer a drug to activate mglu 2 but want to know if it's act 
acting through a specific population of neurons, we can selectively delete mglu2 from the neurons we expect are involved and then see if that abolishes the systemic drug effect. I think that that kind of approach will be a really useful technique to establish circuit-based mechanisms, but still using a kind of classic behavioral pharmacology experimental design. We're really just beginning to scratch the surface of understanding how these receptors work in specific neural circuits, um, and, and that has the potential to impact our understanding of how they influence a, a really wide range of behaviors, uh, especially since mglu 2 is, is expressed in so many different brain areas. Um, and many other groups are taking these types of approaches as well to explore neuron and circuit specific functions of other families of GPCR. So I, I think these approaches have the potential to open up a whole new level of understanding of what GPCRs actually do in the brain of an intact behaving animal. And, and we would just never get this kind of information from just looking at modulation of neurophysiology and brain slices. Agreed, agreed on this one. And it's so great that you have all these tools and you can selectively delete the receptor out of specific regions in the brain. Um, how do you measure the outcome? So these mice more likely are being submitted to regular alcohol, um, you know, exposure, but also plus minus some kind of a drug or a molecule. Um, what, are, what kind of tests do you do? Do you look at um, functional or behavioral tests? Right. So um, we're using kind of a variety of operant behavioral tasks, um, particularly ones that, that look at habitual behavior. So um, just to, to briefly describe what that means um, on a functional level, uh, we, we think about uh, operant behavior where you perform an action and then there's some sort of outcome that happens in response to that action uh, as the there's kind of this dichotomy that people think about of goal-directed versus habitual behavior. So in goal-directed behavior, that's a kind of flexible form of behavior where the behavior is being performed to get the outcome. And so if you manipulate the value of that outcome, let's say, um, let's say you like to eat ice cream. And so you go get some ice cream and you are motivated to, to go drive and get some ice cream because you want to eat some. But now let's say I gave you like eight bowls of ice cream and you just filled up on ice cream. Now, now you have no motivation to go perform that action anymore, right? Because you are full of ice cream already. Um, but if uh, an action is habitual, then it kind of becomes less sensitive to, mm -hmm. to changes in that outcome value. And when you think about alcohol, you might think about it in terms of, well, initially people experience alcohol as a, a pleasurable experience. It might make them less inhibited socially and, uh, and cause kind of mild euphoric feelings. And so, so there's kind of goal directed reasons to want to drink alcohol, but after prolonged heavy use, there might be adverse outcomes associated with that alcohol use. But if it becomes a habit, then your alcohol seeking wouldn't be as sensitive to, to taking into account those adverse outcomes. And this is kind of just one of many important frameworks for thinking about alcohol use disorder. Um, but it's one of the ones that we're kind of focused on in terms of thinking about the role of mglu 2 now. So to, to model this kind of thing in mice, um, yeah, so we can have the mice either drink alcohol or, um, or do other methods of alcohol exposure and then put them in an operant box, a, what a lot of people call a Skinner box, where they perform an action like press a lever to receive some sort of uh, reinforcement like a food pellet or alcohol itself. And um, then we can after they've learned to do that and made that association, we can kind of uh, test to see how manipulating the value of whatever reinforcement they're getting is will affect their behavior. Will if we let them have all the food pellets or alcohol they want before we put them in the chamber, will they just keep pressing that lever anyway because the value of it, the outcome doesn't matter to them anymore, or will they stop because they've already had their fill? Wow. Yeah, it's it's something that I've I have a limited experience working with mice and even more limited or non-existent experience working with 
measuring behavior of mice after exposure to, you know, some drugs or, or some of alcohol, for example. So that's why I wanted to get an idea on what, how does it look in the lab? And now that you have all these phen phenomenal tools where you can delete specific in specific regions of the brain, uh, the mglu 2 receptor, I was just wondering how does that look and what, what was the framework that, that you're looking at? So we've spoken about M mglu 2 uh, you have these phenomenal tools. Uh, what are the other diseases or disease areas that this receptor is involved in? You'd mentioned um, uh, behavioral diseases, but also um, I'm, I'm looking for the word. Um, and I haven't had any alcohol at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, depression and, and, uh, and things like that. Can you talk, talk to us a little bit about that? Right, yeah. So there's preclinical evidence that mglu 2 could be a target for a number of psychiatric disorders. So uh, as you mentioned, uh, schizophrenia, depression, and several agonists and allosteric modulators of mglu 2 have actually advanced to various stages of clinical trials already. So um, the, the good news is that in general, it seems like activating this receptor has been well tolerated. Um, but unfortunately, the trials of mglu 2 ligands in schizophrenic subjects have been mostly disappointing. There's also been more recent preclinical evidence that um, in both rodents and non-human primates that targeting mglu 2 could alleviate levodopa-induced dyskinesia and Parkinson's disease. Um, and that's a really big unmet medical need. So since there's already drugs available that could be used to test that concept in clinical populations, I'm, I'm really interested to see if that idea pans out. Something I'll say that's unfortunate about the, the state of translation for mglu 2 right now is that there's been a number of clinical trials that have been performed evaluating the efficacy of uh, mglu 2 positive allosteric modulators in several different substance use disorders um, for smoking cessation and for cocaine use disorder specifically. But the results of those studies have not been made public. Um, it, it would be really beneficial to the research community if those results were made available, even if they're disappointing. It's important for us to have the opportunity to figure out why promising preclinical results often don't translate to the clinic. For example, in the wake of disappointing results from schizophrenia trials, there's been some really interesting preclinical work done suggesting that prior exposure to atypical antipsychotics, which is something that uh, pretty much all of the subjects in those studies would have had, could impair responses to later treatment with mglu 2 ligands. And so that type of information could be really informative when considering how to design future clinical trials, especially in terms of subpopulations to target. Yeah, agreed, agreed. I think all, all information is good information, negative or positive results. And to better target GPCRs in drug discovery, you, well, you need you know, crystal structures, which are very useful to discover new allosteric modulating, some modulator sites, uh, you need to have the right animal models. You need to have the right tools to, to measure GPCR function. But at the same time, if there is an availability of clinical or preclinical data, that's, that's the holy grail of it because at the end of the day, you can hope or you can have drugs that do whatever you want in, in animal models or in hex cells for that matter. But the whole goal is to, to help people and treat people. And putting all of those elements together is, is what's needed to you know, accelerate GPCR related drug discovery. Right. So I am asking, I ask uh, from everyone here the same question. So do you think GPCR is a good drug target? Usually the answer is yes, but I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. I do think that GPCRs are still good drug targets. Um, I, I think that we still have a lot to learn about how to most effectively target them in various disorders, because a lot of times, as we've been saying, we, we don't really understand the mechanisms on a, a very basic level. So looking at the big picture, I think that the circuit-based approaches to studying GPCR function that I've been talking about, when you think from a, the standpoint of therapeutic strategies, uh, thinking about it on that level has a few major advantages. Um, first, it's important to recognize that GPCRs can modulate neural function in different ways depending on the context. Um, and that extends to responses to different pharmacological manipulations as well. So a 
the same receptor being expressed in different populations of neurons might not affect them in the same way. And, and that's a, just a really important thing to keep in mind. And even if they're expressed in the same type of neurons in a rodent versus a human, they might not do the same things in those neurons. Um, there's also a lot of complexity. Um, so there's evidence that m glue receptors form complexes with other receptors that can affect their downstream signaling and can affect their responses to drugs. So, so these drug responses can be very context dependent. And that adds a, another layer of complication when trying to translate from preclinical models to, to human uh, trials. So, um, the other thing to consider is that, you know, a lot of drugs fail because they have unwanted side effects. And I've been talking a lot about understanding circuit mechanisms of the effect that we want to see to treat a particular disorder. But thinking about the mechanisms of unwanted effects, um, drugs targeting a receptor might have could be really useful as well. So thinking about my lab's work, there's some preclinical evidence that activating mglu 2 might reduce motivation for natural rewards. And that's something that you definitely want to avoid. In my studies, that that effect has been pretty minor, but it's been reported several times in the literature. Um, and so I think it's still important to consider when thinking from a translational perspective and, and figuring out the mechanisms that contribute to side effects could really help people who are developing these drugs design strategies that avoid that. Definitely. That also has been uh, a big issue when it comes to side effects because GBCRs are so complex. They're everywhere. Uh, I just learned, uh, I had a, a great chat with, with a scientist um, and they work on bitter taste receptors. And it turns out that you can have bitter taste receptors in the heart, which I've never heard of before having. I didn't know that And in the gut as well. So they're everywhere. And I think gathering as much information as possible on what circuits they activate, what signaling pathways they activate, and where they're expressed and what they do at those sites is, is invaluable. It's just amazing information that will help us better understand uh, receptor function. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, another good reason to think about where these receptors are and how they act when we're thinking about drug discovery and translation from preclinical models to, to clinical success is, you know, we talked about this concept of people having their favorite receptor. And I think that people do maybe sometimes get a little bit uh, narrowly focused on a particular receptor. And from my perspective, I think that maybe if we start thinking more about what effects we want on brain function and what receptors could achieve that and, and kind of, you know, take a step back from that attachment to our favorite receptors, that we might have a little bit more translational success because maybe the effect that I want to have by activating mglu 2 has the effect I want in a rodent brain, but doesn't have it in a human brain. But maybe there's another receptor there that will have the effect that we want in the human brain. So that information that we got from the rodent studies could still be valuable. We just have to figure out what receptor is well positioned to have the same type of effect in a human brain. Before I let you go today, I wanted to hear more about your thoughts and what would be your advice to junior scientists who are um, aspiring to contribute to the field? Yeah, so I one thing I've noticed is that technology changes so rapidly these days that it can be hard to keep up with sometimes. And I think a lot of researchers feel pressure to constantly be incorporating the newest and flashiest tools into their research. So uh, one piece of advice that I have is to just be careful not to focus too much on finding ways to force the newest technology into your research. Really focus on the biological questions that are most interesting and important to you. And then think through what approaches you can use to answer those questions. You know, let, let the science lead you. Um, if you take that approach, you'll have plenty of moments where you realize that a new tool could take your research to another level, but there's no reason to force it just because you feel like you should be incorporating a popular technique. 
eventually you'll have questions that are difficult or impossible to answer without some major technological technological advance that doesn't exist yet. But if you keep your eyes open, um, it, it's amazing how quickly new tools are being developed these days. And, and it's likely that something will come along that, that helps you. Definitely, definitely. And one, one thing that um, I could think of as well when it comes to, to advice is follow the science and follow your passion. Oh, yes. You, you, were, you were passionate about understanding GBCR function at a, at a biological level, at a behavioral level, and that's what led you to where you are today. And following the scientific questions is also very important uh, at this point. Um, uh, there has been a lot of chat about diversity in the field. What are your thoughts on the diversity in the field and how can we increase it? As you know, and I'm sure we agree on this, having multiple people, different people from different areas, from different uh, cultures, from different uh, you know, areas in the world is always helpful to bring new ideas and new approaches to, to study GBCRs. For, for example, what are your thoughts on diversity? Right, I, I do think that uh loss of talent in STEM fields due to racism, sexism, ableism, and lots of other forms of discrimination has really hurt scientific progress for way too long. And I am glad that this topic is finally getting more attention, although it's a series of extremely unfortunate and maddening events that have brought us to these conversations. I think it's really important that we actively work to establish and maintain inclusive and equitable environments for people from backgrounds that are underrepresented in science. Um, a major problem that I see that doesn't get enough attention is that the work of increasing diversity has typically been left to people who belong to underrepresented groups. and that creates this extra labor that is really an unfair burden on those people. And I think that everyone with privilege really needs to work harder to, to share that work. Right now, I also think it's especially important that we take time to listen to other people's experiences, um, do work to educate ourselves, and really focus, uh, something I'm trying to do right now is really focus on centering the voices of Black people and members of other underrepresented groups in science. We happen to be having this conversation during Black in Noro week, and I really encourage listeners to check out their content and get inspired by all the remarkable talent they're showcasing, as well as a variety of anti-racism resources. Thank you for that. Yes, I did see, I did see that on, on Twitter earlier, earlier this week. Uh, one thing I would like to add to, to this, I think the role of mentorship, mentors are extremely important in making sure that there, there is no discrimination. What you know and what you bring to science and the hard work you put into science should be the only determinant uh, to your success. And you've been in, in Jeff Kahn's group and in a big group where you were exposed to phenomenal technology, to phenomenal scientists. And that also helped you, at least from what we've been talking, to build your confidence and go out there and define the scientific questions you're interested in and go after them. And I think mentorship is, is, a, key, is a key component in making sure that everyone succeeds to the best of their abilities independently on where they come from or, or what gender they are or what, uh, you know, what minority or underrepresented uh, community they come from. Right. Absolutely. And I think we talk a lot about uh, what needs to change on an institutional level, but there's things that we can all do on a, a smaller level to, to really create welcoming environments just in our own lab spaces. You know, put up signs that show that everyone is welcome there to show that, that you support everybody. Um, and, and, don't shy away from conversations about other people's experiences that that they might need to have or that they might want to share, even if they make you uncomfortable. Agreed. Agreed. Definitely. Speaking of, of lab space, uh, I wanted to see uh, when you have uh, job openings in your group, where do you post these? And before you answer that question, I wanted to tell our audience and tell you as well, 
uh, that we do have a career page. So the idea is to gather as many GPCR-related job um, jobs that are out there, whether they're academ academic or industry-related jobs, because one thing I realize is that when you love your GPCR or your GPCRs, and you want to continue working on them in a different setting, sometimes it's very hard, unless it's an academic setting, to find a position, uh, for example, in industry. So the goal is to gather as many uh, job descriptions and job uh, ads in the same place to help the GPCR community. Right. Yeah, so, um, so I have done most advertising on, on Twitter, um, also uh, through local universities. Mm -hmm. um, so and we do have uh, institutional pages as well um you know I, I don't have any official job postings right now but i would certainly encourage anybody who uh, you know shares overlapping interests to to reach out and contact me if they are interested because you know there's often you know something we could work out to to make something happen um if if the scientific interests are a really good fit and I think it's great that you've created this this forum for people to uh, look for jobs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, one other thing I want to tell uh, the audience is that uh, this conversation will be shared in the podcast, but also we will have a transcript. And as well, you'll get a, a whole a website page where we will share the transcript, the link to the, to the recording, and I will also share your uh, contact information and the university information so that people who are interested in working with you can reach out more easily to you. Great, thank you. Super, super. So last question. I know now is not the time to go to conferences. Most of them <laughs> are went virtual, but um, putting COVID aside and putting everything that's happened this year aside, what are the conferences where people can find you? What are your favorite places to go? Yeah, so um, in terms of you know, thinking about what is a good conference to be exposed to different ideas. It, this might be a somewhat unpopular opinion, but I really love the annual meeting of the Society for Neuroscience. Um, and I think that if you're somebody who's interested in neuropharmacology, but you're trying to figure out exactly what research areas interest you the most, so there's there's really no other meeting that would give you the breadth of opportunities to, to talk to people who do different types of research. Um, there's usually around 30,000 attendees at that meeting. Um, so many people find it overwhelming for that reason. Uh, but there's a huge emphasis on poster sessions there and that creates opportunities to strike up conversations with people. And in my experience, that often leads to more inspiration than sitting and listening to a talk. It, it also just gives you more networking opportunity. Of course, as you mentioned, people aren't really traveling to conferences right now and, and might be thinking about how they can kind of replace those experiences from the comfort of their own homes and safety. Um, I've, I've been pretty amazed to see how some people have stepped up to uh, provide high quality content in other formats. So I've attended a couple of great virtual conferences already. Um, there was a virtual dopamine conference in May that was absolutely incredible for thinking about dopamine receptor function. And um, and there's many more of these planned and, and people are learning all the time how to, to make them better better and to make them as interactive as possible, even when people aren't physically together. So I think uh, watching out for these events is, is a really good idea. It's also much more equitable access to these events because you don't have to come up with the money to travel anywhere. So it, I think, you know, it could really create some, some great opportunities that people might not otherwise not have. There's also some really great virtual seminar series that have started uh, since conferences were canceled. And, you know, if you're interested in finding more of these types of events, I highly recommend uh, joining social media platforms, especially Twitter, because that's where these opportunities tend to be announced the most. Oh, agreed. I think Twitter is, is budging of all of these opportunities and anyone and everyone working on GPCRs is on Twitter because it's easy to share. You just tweet something. It's a short message. You add on, you know, a hashtag, you add on a link to, to your conference or, or something like that. And you're all set. And it's also a great way to, to meet so many GPCR aficionados. Absolutely. 
Agreed. Uh, so thank you so much, Carrie, for your time. I really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, we wish you all the best. Um, keep in touch and thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this Dr. GPCR podcast episode. We hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. I'd like to thank our guest, Atila Forrest, Jin Chong, and Shivani Sashdev. Music by Rosa Bershish. I'm your host, Dr. Yamina Bershish. We're always excited to hear from you. Visit us at drgpcr.com or send us a note at hello at drgpcr.com. I also wanted to wish you happy holidays and a very happy new year. I'd like to thank this year's guests and thank you for being such a wonderful audience. Thank you again for the privilege of your time and until next time, stay safe. Mm-hmm.